The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 13th chapter. Jesus put before the crowds another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seeds in the field, but while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, an enemy has done this. And the slave said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, no, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds and the field? And Jesus answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man, the field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. And the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let anyone with ears listen. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Beloved, grace, mercy, and peace are yours from the God who is our faithful parent. Amen. Our gospel reading this morning is the second seed-sowing parable from Jesus to the crowds that were following him and to his disciples, who, bless their hearts, didn't understand a word he was saying. You should know that in the South, bless their hearts isn't exactly what it sounds like on the surface. And Lori did a great job in story time, um, kind of telling us what this parable means. So for our time together today, I'm going to leave the disciples and the weeping and gnashing of teeth behind, and I'm going to turn to Paul's letter to the believers in Rome, which was our second reading this morning. And in doing so, I want to start by telling you a story. Katie had enjoyed a typical childhood. She was deeply loved by her mother and father. She was doted on by her big brothers. She was a shy and sensitive child. She loved to read and sing. Sadly, Katie's parents' marriage ended when she was just nine years old, addiction doing what it often does, severing the bond that had created their family. But Katie continued to be deeply loved by her mother and her big brothers. And eventually, Katie's mom, Lynn, met Bert. And after a couple of years of getting to know each other and falling deeply in love, Lynn and Bert married, and Bert became the stepfather to Katie, who by then was a teenager. Lucky Bert. (laughs) He got to begin his parenting journey with a teenage girl. But he was the one who taught Katie to drive, whose advice to her was always be aware of your surroundings. He was the one who gave her her first camera and taught her how to use it. He was the one to shuttle her to and from school and events and activities and lessons. He was the one Katie called for that no questions asked ride home. And when she would lash out, as teenagers sometimes do, you aren't really my father, 
Bert didn't flinch. He steadfastly supported her and loved her. Bert often told Lynn that he would love to adopt Katie, but that would have been a messy family process. So the little family lived together in love and in hope. And when Katie was about to turn 21, she told her mother that she wanted to petition the courts to let Bert adopt her and that she wanted to surprise him with it for Father's Day. So Lynn and Katie managed all the legalities and the paperwork, and on Father's Day, Katie presented Bert with the adoption paperwork, ready for his signature, along with a chocolate cigar that said, it's a girl. (laughs) Some months later at the courthouse, Lynn and Bert and Katie arrived so early for the adoption proceedings that the courtroom was not even open yet. They waited in the hallway, impatiently pacing and peeking through the crack in the courtroom doors for the arrival of the bailiff. And when they finally entered, they waited through case after case, the stern judge admonishing those who had done wrong and throwing out other cases. And finally, when it was their turn, the judge's shoulders relaxed as he picked up that folder. And he called Katie and Bert forward. And he turned into a comedian as he reminded Bert that being the father of a 21-year-old daughter meant there would always need to be an extra bedroom in the house and that he would always be the one to pay for lunch. (laughs) They laughed nervously, kind of like you all just did, but with happy Thanksgiving. And just like that, with the stroke of a pen and the handshake of a judge and the spontaneous outburst of applause and cheers from the courtroom, what had been true in heart and in hope became true in fact and in law. Katie was Bert's daughter. Paul tells the believers at Rome that we have received a spirit of adoption that we, each of us, groan inwardly while we wait to be adopted as God's children, while we await belonging to the one who loves us with a love that does not and will not end, with a love that does not depend on our understanding or our deeds. And Paul says that everyone who are led by God, are children of God. And so we cry out to God as Abba. You may know that loosely translated Abba means daddy or pops or some other diminutive, but it's more than that. It's more nuanced than that in Aramaic because it it implies this very deep relationship. It is familiar, it is loving, it is constant. Such a relationship is exactly what Paul invites us into, that we would love and trust God who already loves us beyond measure. And Paul says that this relationship means that we, the adopted children of God, are heirs of God and heirs together with Christ. As Katie and Bert and anyone who has an adoption story in their family knows, the paperwork and the judge make official a relationship that already exists, a love that already loves. It makes the newly adopted an heir legally Katie got a brand new birth certificate with Bert's name listed as her father. Our baptisms are similar. As a sacrament, they are an outward sign of something that God has already done. If you were listening in confirmation, you know this. As a rite, an R-I-T-E, they ritualize within the community, what has already happened. That God has adopted us and that we are a part of the whole communion of saints. 
But in baptism, we take that truth and we place it in community. We celebrate it together. We sing and we pray and maybe we even applaud and cheer. And then if we get a certificate, we have the paperwork to go with it. This section of Paul's letter to the Romans is a precursor to what are some of the most amazing verses about the truth of God's covenant to God's people. And we get to hear those verses next week. That's your precursor to that sermon. They are about the gift of the Spirit who intercedes for us. They are about how God desires our good and about the fact that nothing Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor anything in all the world can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. But in order to hear and believe those promises, we need to first believe that they are for us. For us, the adopted and beloved children of God. These are wondrous gifts to us, dear ones, and we could end the sermon right here. We could be home early. We could have a beautiful lunch, and we might be happy with that. But there are some additional threads in this passage that matter for the church today. One is that our groaning for adoption is not the only groaning that is talked about in this passage. Creation also groans. Paul writes that creation waits with eager longing, having been subjected to futility, not of its own will. The church and God's people cannot ignore the groaning of creation. Everywhere, creation groans. Water temperatures off the coast of Florida have reached over 90 degrees, endangering everything that lives there upsetting the entire ecosystem of the ocean. Temperatures in Phoenix have topped 110 degrees for almost two straight weeks. Flooding and fires and snowstorms happen in places where it used to not even snow at all. With melting glaciers and raging wildfires, creation is groaning and the church cannot remain silent. And we cannot remain complicit. A second thread that's crucial to note is that nothing in this passage from Romans is about individual people. It is all about relationships. It is about our relationships with God. It is about being joint heirs together with Christ. It is about being joint heirs together with Christ as the communion of saints. It is about being in relationship to creation. In the original Greek, all of the verbs in this section of Romans are in plural form. We are to act together with others, with creation. We are not created for a solitary life. We are created for relationship, and that begins with our relationship to God. Finally, Paul speaks of hope. And he speaks of hope as an active stance, hope that is done in community, hope that believes there is something more, that there is more than the hardship that has come into our lives, that there is more than the abandonment we feel, that there is more than a world on fire, that there is more than the return to the injustices we are witnessing in our government, that there is more than the isolation we feel when we don't remember that we are children of God, adopted children of God, each one of us, every one of us. There is a way and a sign to remember that, though, and I offer it to you today if you have not already done so. I actually saw a couple of you do this on your way in. But I invite you to dip your fingers in the baptismal font at the entrance to the sanctuary and make the sign of the cross, however that feels good to you, and remember, dear ones, that you belong to God. 
Luther said we should do this every morning, wherever we are, bathroom, mirror, whatever, and say, baptismus zoom, which means I am baptized. I am baptized. That's like our superpower. I am baptized. That squirrel should have said, I am baptized. <laughs> we could also do it and say, I am adopted. I am a child of God. We are children of God. Just as Katie belongs to Bert and he to her, we belong to God. So I should actually tell you that the names in that story were made up. They are the middle names of the people who that story is actually about. And that story is actually about my family. Uh, Katie is Taylor Catherine, my daughter. Bert is sitting in the second row right there. And that is our story. And friends, you have an adoption story. The story of how you waited with eager longing, with hope for what you have not yet seen, and yet how God adopted you as God's own child. Even if you had been the only person on earth, God would have adopted you so that you would know fully, that you would know forever, that you, and you, and you, and you, are the children of God. You, we, belong to God. And that is the good news for the people of God on this day and every day. Thanks be to God, and let the church say, <laughs>